Welcome to Introduction to Bioengineering. We're going to talk about medicines for endangered frogs in this lecture. We want to consider whether or not we can use bioengineering to make medicines for endangered species. Our test case today is going to be this golden frog called Atepolis teschi, and it is about three and a half to 4.8 centimeters long, so it's a really small frog. And it was last seen in the wild in the Panamanian cloud forests and central rainforests in Central America. Um, it was seen in 2009 in these places, but hasn't been seen in the wild since then. These frogs are adorable. They uh, communicate to predators um, that they're poisonous through their bright yellow skin color, but they communicate to other frogs through this behavior called semaphore uh, or waving, sort of flag waving. And they do this in order to um, kind of discuss mating and all kinds of other sort of territorial behaviors. It's a really um, cute little frog and it be went extinct in the wild because of a combination of habitat loss and a fungal disease called chytrid mycosis. Chytrid mycosis is caused by the chytrid fungus. Um, and in the last 30 years, this uh, uh, fungus that causes chytrid mycosis has been linked to the decline or extinction of more than 200 species of frogs and salamanders throughout the world. Um, this fungus infects the outer skin layers of the frog which usually frogs use to hydrate and control their body temperatures and to regulate minerals and nutrients. Um, the infection makes the skin thicker and less permeable to air and to other um, electrolytes causing imbalances and a loss of muscle control. Eventually it causes heart failure and death. Um, it's spread from frog to frog by contact. And so it's very difficult to um, prevent the spread of this fungal disease once it's in a specific location. Here's the life cycle of this um, uh, fungus, this chytrid fungus. It uh, has little spores that can actually move in the water and swim towards frogs. Once it reaches a frog, it burrows into the skin and then um, matures and starts to release new spores, kind of causing this infection to spread along the skin. This is the, the stage that causes that skin thickening. And uh, infected frogs will usually die about 120 days after infection. So it's also pretty rapid. Now, this chytrid fungus spread really quickly through Central America. It was first discovered up in Costa Rica in 1987, and by 2006 had swept all the way across Panama, um, causing you know, the decline of those amphibious species that we were just talking about. Now, incredibly, not all frogs and salamanders, not all amphibians are sensitive to this chytrid fungus. Some seem to be resistant to chytrid mycosis. Here's two examples of a salamander and a frog species that are resistant. And in studying these uh, amphibians, scientists have figured out that they produce antifungal compounds on their skin that seem to protect them from disease. So here's some examples of these antifungal compounds that have been found on the surfaces of these amphibians. And they're at um, pretty high concentrations, they can actually suppress the growth of the chytrid fungus. Um, so researchers thought that, um, you know, maybe it was not the frogs themselves that were producing these compounds, but their skin bacteria. There's a lot of sharing of production of um, compounds between a host organism and the microbes that live in and around them. And it turns out that they were correct in some cases. So one of the bacterium that colonizes these red-bellied salamanders um, is called Dantheobacterium lividium, and this bacterium produces an antifungal compound called violacin. What they found was that when uh, frogs were colonized with this bacteria, well, this is not the Panamanian golden frog, it's a different type of frog that is a natural host for this bacterium. Um, when they are colonized with the bacteria and challenged with the fungus that causes chytrid mycosis, the um, frogs are able to clear the infection and they all survive. However, if they treat the frogs with antibiotics to remove the bacteria from their skin, then um, infecting them with the chytrid fungus causes the frogs to succumb to the fungal disease and die. So this is a good example showing that it's actually this frog skin bacteria that is protecting them from this chytrid fungus. 
Now, the golden frog does not have um, this type of bacteria living on its skin, but um, researchers thought that it might be possible to just introduce that bacteria to the frog, right? Maybe they don't have this one naturally growing on their skin, but they could introduce it and maybe protect the frog from disease. Now, unfortunately, adding the bacteria to these Panamanian golden frogs did not protect them from chytridmycosis. When they challenged the frogs that either had been introduced, had the bacteria put on their skin or did not have the bacteria put on their skin with this chytrid fungus, which is represented as BD here, um, the frogs showed no difference in survival. So the bacterium were not able to help the frogs. And um, one of the hypotheses for why these bacteria did not help the frogs was because that they were not suited, well suited for survival on these golden frogs' skin. Right? They had evolved over many, many years to live on the backs of these other types of frogs and salamanders. And so on the skin of this golden frog, the bacteria couldn't survive. So, um, oh, and this is just showing actual quantification of the bacterium um, over time. And it does not, in fact, survive for very long on the, um, on the, the surface of the skin. Okay, so this is um, where some of the bioengineering comes into effect. Uh, Dr. Matthew Becker and Brian Ratwick at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute reached out to my PhD advisor, who's a bioengineer at MIT, Professor Christopher Voigt, to ask if they could, um, if we could help them engineer one of the bacteria that is usually found on the skin of these Panamanian golden frogs to produce the antifungal compound violacin. The thought was that if one of the bacteria that usually survives on the skin was producing these compounds, then those bacteria would be able to survive for a much longer period of time and protect the frogs from disease. So we decided to try and help them. And I'm gonna walk you through the different bioengineering steps um, that we undertook in order to try to make a probiotic for this endangered frog species. I should point out that even though these frogs were extinct in the wild, there were still colonies of them at a couple of zoos um, around the world. And so there are still potentially frogs that could be reintroduced to the wild. We want to make sure that if we reintroduce them, that they are resistant to the fungus and not all going to die immediately upon um, going back into the Panamanian rainforest. Okay, so the first step to figuring out or creating this um, probiotic for these frogs is to figure out which of the bacteria that usually colonize their skin we can grow in the lab. If we want to be able to engineer these bacteria, we need to be able to culture them in the lab. And so we uh, swabbed the frogs, or rather Matt Becker and Brian Katowicz swabbed the frogs and then sent us samples of all of the skin bacteria that they could culture. So we had this nice collection of um, around 11 or 12 skin bacteria that we could grow in the lab. And then we needed to figure out which of the bacteria were resistant to antibiotics. So in order to engineer this bacteria, we will need to introduce new DNA into the bacteria. And when we introduce new segments of DNA to the bacteria, we usually also introduce an antibiotic resistance gene. The co-introduction of the antibiotic resistance gene and the pathway for violacin, the biosynthetic pathway, means that we can select for bacteria that have this new piece of DNA by um, introducing antibiotics to the media where we're growing the bacteria. So the idea is that only the ones that have our new piece of DNA will be able to survive in the antibiotic. Now that type of approach works really well, but it has to start with a bacteria that is sensitive to the antibiotic that you're trying to use. If the bacteria is already resistant, then it won't matter if you apply um, or introduce new DNA and apply antibiotics to select for the bacteria, all of them will grow regardless of whether they have your DNA or not. Okay, so we tested um, a couple of different antibiotics and a couple of concentrations for each antibiotic to figure out um, which ones they were sensitive to. And some bacteria like these Chrysiobacterium were resistant to all of the different antibiotics that we tested, 
So we wouldn't be able to engineer these bacteria very easily um, using that method that I talked about where you introduce your pathway along with an antibiotic resistance marker. So we chose not to pursue engineering this Chrysiobacterium. But the others in the set had antibiotics that they were sensitive to and we could therefore try to engineer. Um, okay, so we figured out what antibiotics we could potentially use. Then we needed to design a um, segment of DNA that encodes for a biosynthetic uh, enzymes for violacin. So we know what enzymes are essential in this Janthiobacterium. That's the bacteria that naturally produces violacin. Um, we know what enzymes are essential within them for creating violacin from the uh, amino acid tryptophan. It is a five uh, enzyme pathway. And we um, designed a synthetic piece of DNA where all five of these enzymes are placed downstream of an inducible promoter. Um, so this promoter just becomes active in response to a small molecule. So we can choose when to turn on production of violacin and when to keep it off. Now, we also needed to identify a method of introducing DNA into these bacteria. For bacteria that are commonly engineered, like E. coli, there are lots of different methods of introducing DNA into the bacteria. But for undomesticated or wild strains of bacteria, this step can actually be really challenging. What we chose to use is this triparental mating method, where we have an E. coli strain that has a plasmid that encodes for a type three secretion system. This, or sorry, type four secretion system. Um, and this has a, a bunch of proteins that encode for essentially a needle that will stick the E. coli to other cells that it comes into contact with. And through that needle, it can actually pump DNA. So this E. coli strain is mixed with an E. coli donor. This E. coli donor strain um, has either a GFP or arveolosin biosynthetic pathway on it. And when it is mixed with the helper, it actually um, receives this helper plasmid that encodes for that type 4 secretion system, and then will poke into our recipient cells and deliver, in this case, the plasmid um, that encodes for our GFP gene or our um, violacin biosynthetic pathway. We made two different versions of this plasmid, one with GFP and one with violacin, just to make the process of figuring out how to transform the bacteria easier. But yeah, so by mixing the skin bacteria with these two E. coli strains, we can introduce new DNA into this skin bacterium. When we transform the pathway that has the entire violacin biosynthetic, or when we transform the DNA that encodes the entire violacin biosynthetic pathway, we can get uh, purple bacteria. This violacin compound is purple. And then we can use LCMS in order to figure out um, whether or not the bacteria are producing exactly the compound of interest. So if our standard purified violacin gives us a specific signature in um, our chromatography, then our violacin um, extract from these bacteria will give us the same one if they are producing the uh, compound that we're interested in. So using these methods, we were able to confirm that the skin bacteria can produce violacin. And then we picked a location within the genome in order to integrate the violacin pathway. So we didn't want to have the DNA floating around as a circle um, within the skin strain. In this case, we're calling the uh, frog skin strain 63F. This is just our shorthand for the strain. And we picked a location within the genome to integrate it that was um, next to some tRNAs, but not um, in any essential genes. So by integrating it into the genome, we can uh, confirm that the uh, DNA sticks around even uh, if the bacteria is not exposed to the antibiotic that is kind of selecting for just the bacteria that contain our new piece of DNA. Okay, so once we have the strain engineered, we can compare uh, it to the wild type strain. So we wanna make sure that introducing violacin biosynthesis into the skin strain does not interfere with its growth. So we measured how quickly the bacteria grow in two different types of media, 
one that's like a rich media that provides everything that the bacteria need to grow at a high concentration, and one that's a more minimal media um, that is, we hope, more closely related to the uh, environment the bacteria will experience on the skin, the frog's skin. And in both situations, we see that the um, engineered bacteria, which is shown as the purple bar, and the wild type bacteria, which is shown as the yellow bar, grow at about the same rate. And then in competition experiments where we mix the strain at either a one to one ratio or a one to 10 ratio, we see that our um, engineered bacteria is able to persist. And so it does well, not just growing by itself, but growing in competition with the unengineered bacteria. So we determined after these steps that these strains were ready to be tested on the skin of the bacteria, or sorry, of the frog. So we shipped them from MIT down to the Smithsonian um, Conservation Institute, where Matt Becker uh, applied them to the skin of the frogs to see if they could help the, if the engineered bacteria could help the frogs survive um, exposure to this chytrid fungus. And unfortunately, what we found was that the engineered bacteria did not protect the frogs from disease compared to control frogs, which did not have exposure to the chytrid fungus, the strains with our engineered bacteria or without it behaved or behaved the same. So all of them, the engineered bacteria were unable to protect the frogs from disease. What we found was that even though we engineered these strains to, um, which were native um, to this frog to produce violacin, but when we looked for them four days after the introduction of the bacteria to the frog skin, we didn't find any of the bacteria. That's what this white bar is showing you right here. And that was surprising because the unengineered version of this strain did survive on the frog skin for uh, many days. But uh, somehow introducing this violacin pathway, engineering the strain, made it less competitive on the frog's skin and it was not able to survive for very long, which is probably why it was unable to protect the frog from this chytrid fungus. So uh, unfortunately, this is a story where our attempts to engineer a, um, a probiotic for these frogs that would help it um, survive and hopefully allow us to reintroduce these endangered species back into the wild was not successful, but it was just our first attempt at this. And so our reflective questions are mostly centered around whether or not um, you know, we can improve this type of approach in order to actually make um, probiotics for endangered species. So the questions I want you to think about are, is it a good idea to engineer probiotics for endangered animals? Do you think this is an approach that we should even be pursuing? To ponder why the engineered bacteria did not protect the frogs from disease, told you that they didn't persist for very long on the skin, but could there be other reasons why these engineered bacteria um, were unsuccessful? What could we do in order to improve the probiotic? And then are there other strategies we should consider taking to save the frogs? So I hope that this has sort of expanded your perspective on bioengineering and the types of organisms that we can engineer solutions for, health solutions for, and um, that it also shows you that we have a ways to go before we are able to make really productive or beneficial probiotics for organisms that we don't know and understand quite as well as people. All right, thanks. Sure.